Prologue Elizabeth Miller took a deep sniff of the beautiful summer air. It was hot, but she didn't mind. She was off work for a change and she'd sneaked away from her family. She sighed. She'd never really understood why their younger brothers and sisters had made Susan so crazy. Yes, they had always annoyed her, but they hadn't made her want to hurt them. Now that she was the oldest at home? She wanted to hurt each and every one of them on a daily basis. Today, though, she was on her way to town to mail a letter to Susan, her older sister. Susan had moved away a year before to be a mail-order bride and now lived happily with her husband and four sons in Fort Worth, Texas of all places. She wondered how Susan would react if she just showed up on her doorstep and said she couldn't handle the demon horde any longer. The good people of their church had nicknamed their younger brothers and sister the demon horde years ago, and she fully understood why. They were hellions, each and every one of them. Elizabeth didn't walk fast, because she was in no hurry to go back home. She would go to the post office and mail her letter, and then maybe she'd go to the mercantile and look around. She hadn't been there in a while. She had days off so rarely that it was time she took full advantage. She felt a touch of guilt that she hadn't told her mother she wasn't working that day, but she was so happy to finally be able to get away, she tried to ignore the guilt. When she got to the post office, she heard a familiar voice from the front of the line. When the woman turned around, limping toward her, she knew she was right. Mrs. Long. The older woman stopped in front of Elizabeth and smiled. Susan Miller's sister. Elizabeth? Is that right? Elizabeth smiled and nodded. You're good with names. Sometimes I am. I try to be. Harriet Long was flipping two letters in her hands over and over. I'm mailing a letter to my sister now. She's so happy. Thank you for what you did for her. I'm so happy there's a mail-order bride service in our town to help people who need it. Elizabeth stepped to the front of the line and gave the postmistress her letter. Anything for my family? The postmistress smiled and handed her a letter. You got another letter from Susan. Elizabeth clutched the letter to her chest and saw Harriet was still standing there waiting for her. She held up her letter. I got one from Susan. Harriet smiled. I'm glad. She seems really happy when I hear from her. Oh, she is. You really changed her life. Elizabeth stepped out of the post office and breathed happily. I love days off. Would you like to have a piece of pie next door? Harriet asked. Elizabeth nodded. That sounds fine. I have all day to do whatever I want, but my parents don't know I'm off, so I need to be gone all day. Harriet laughed, linking her arm through Elizabeth's. Let's have lunch then. She led Elizabeth to the small cafe and they sat down at a table in the corner. How's business going? Elizabeth asked once they'd ordered their food. It's going really well, but I'm about to have to close it. I'm going to be a mail-order bride myself. Elizabeth gawked at Harriet for a moment before shaking her head. You can't close the business. What about the women who need a way out? They need to be able to do something. Harriet shrugged. I agree, but I'm moving to Seattle. Elizabeth sighed, looking down at the table. I'm really happy for you. I'm just sad for the women of Beckham. She'd heard stories about other women in the area being able to leave and be happy thanks to Harriet's services. She really felt like the town was better off for having a mail-order bride service there. Do you have any friends who could take it over? Harriet shook her head. I don't. I don't know who I would even ask. She sighed and suddenly her face lit up as she looked at Elizabeth. What about you? Have you ever wanted to run a business? Elizabeth slowly shook her head. I love the idea of being independent, but I live with my family. You know, the demon horde? 
There's no way I could run a business with that kind of chaos going on around me. Harriet seemed to think about the problem. I was worried I was going to have to let all the servants in my house go. I'm taking my butler, Higgins, with me, but I need someone who will be willing to stay in the house. I can set up a fund that the money for household upkeep will come from. That way no one will have to find a new job, and you'll have a place to work. Elizabeth stared at Harriet in shock. Are you saying I can live in your beautiful house with no cost? Harriet laughed. The cost will be learning to run my business and helping the women of Beckham. I'll have to speak to my parents, of course, but I love the idea. I won't be 18 until October. Would you have a problem with me running it before I turn 18? I won't. But I'll want to pick out a new butler for you. Someone who will be able to run any errands you need and take care of problems. Higgins can show him how to do the job before he goes. Elizabeth smiled, her eyes bright. I'd love to do it then. I can't think of anything that would make me happier than helping others. Harriet squeezed Elizabeth's hand. It's a deal then. Talk to your parents and come to me tomorrow. I leave in a month, and I want every minute of that to talk to you about how I do things. Chapter 1 Albert stared down at the burnt roast and wanted to scream. How many meals would he burn before he figured out how to make a simple dinner for his family? It was a good thing the local bakery kept stocked with bread, or his children would never have anything to eat. Looks like we're having bread and jam again, kids. He walked to the door and tossed out the black meat. We like bread and jam, Papa, Gertrude insisted. Gertrude was six, and she did her best around the house, but her mother had barely had a chance to teach her any of her skills before her death six months prior. Robert, the youngest at four, nodded. Bread and jam is good. Albert sighed as he turned back to them. I'm glad you think so. It's not exactly healthy for you, though. He quickly cut several pieces of bread off the loaf from the work table and put them on a plate in the middle of the table, along with butter and a jar of jam he'd picked up from the mercantile. They sat down, and he bowed his head praying over the meal. He watched as the children devoured the bread. Their manners had deteriorated a great deal since his wife had died as well. Why hadn't she lived long enough to see her children grown up? What had happened? As he ate his own meal, he thought again about the advertisement he'd seen in the paper. Are you lonely? Not enough women to choose from? For a small fee, we'll send a woman to you. Your expenses include her travel and spending money. Send a letter with your requirements to Harriet Long, General Delivery Beckham, Massachusetts, to inquire. He looked at the little faces, now both covered in jam, and decided it was time. He couldn't keep trying to raise them on his own while running his ranch. It was just too hard. Gertrude watched over Robert all day, but he constantly worried about them, and rode back to the house several times a day, costing him valuable hours he could be working and mending fences before it got too cold. Montana wasn't known for staying warm year-round, after all. After the dishes were done and then children tucked into bed, he sat down at the table and wrote a letter. He didn't know how long it would take, but two months was too long at this point. He needed a wife yesterday. Asterisk. Clara walked into Beckham, trying not to drag her feet. She needed to talk to the banker, and she knew his response wouldn't be favorable. When her husband had died two years before, She'd been sure that she could keep farming and make enough to support her and their two children. Now, she wasn't sure she could even face the banker. She had to ask for an extension, but she feared she already knew what his answer would be. She'd put on her prettiest dress for this meeting, but that wasn't saying much. She'd had pretty clothes before Nathan had died, but she hadn't been able to afford new clothes since. She just couldn't consistently work as much of the land as he'd been able to. She walked into the bank and smiled at the teller at the front.
He's waiting for you, Mrs. Baldwin, the young man said. Clara walked to the back of the bank, to the small office, where she knew the bank manager would be waiting for her. She knocked once on the open door and took the chair he indicated. She waited for him to start the conversation, because he'd been the one to call her there. I'm sure you know why I've asked you here, Mr. Baxter said. Clara sighed. I'm not going to pay the full amount this harvest. Can you give me an extension until this time next year? She knew the answer. He'd told her last year that if she didn't pay it in full this October, she and her children would be out on their ears. He sighed and leaned back in his chair, shaking his head. You know I can't do that. What kind of a businessman would I be if I kept extending loans to people who will obviously never be able to pay them back? Clara didn't say anything. She just played with the front of her dress, forming pleats and then laying them flat. What could she say? You'll need to have the full amount by the end of October, or I will be foreclosing on your land. Clara stood and left his office. She knew no amount of tears would change his mind. Mr. Baxter was known for removing widows and orphans from land when money was owed. He had quite a reputation. She had a bit of money, and since she was going to be evicted, she decided to spend it to make a new dress for her daughter. The girls' dresses showed an indecent amount of calf, and now that she was ten, people were starting to look at her funny. She walked into the mercantile and immediately went to the wanted ads on the back wall. She had to find a job she could do before she lost the farm. A job that would pay enough to support her and both children. Most of the notices were for farm workers, and she knew she'd never make enough that way, even if someone would hire a woman. She quickly read over the different notices, tacked there, and stopped when she saw one that might work. Mail Order Bride Agency needs women who are looking for the adventure of their lives. Men out west need women to marry. Reply in person at 300 Rock Creek Road. See Miss Elizabeth Miller. The Millers went to her church, and she knew that the older daughter had been a mail-order bride, but she'd had no idea Elizabeth had taken over the running of the agency. She studied the address for a moment and set out before she lost her nerve. Surely somewhere in the West was a man who wanted to marry a 30-year-old widow with a 10-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. Right? Clara was surprised by the house she found when she reached the address. How was Elizabeth Miller able to afford to live here? She knocked on the door and held her breath while she waited. A young man in his mid-twenties came to the door. He had blonde hair and blue eyes, but a formal manner. May I help you? Yes, I'm here to see Miss Miller. Tell her that Clara Baldwin is calling. Come inside. He led her down the hall, to a door on the left. Is Miss Miller expecting you? Clara shook her head. No, she isn't. He opened the door and said, There's a Clara Baldwin here to see you, Miss Miller. Elizabeth hurried to the door. Mrs. Baldwin. It's good to see you. She indicated the couch behind her. Come in and have a seat. Clara was astonished by the lack of surprise in Elizabeth's eyes. She'd known the girl since she was small. I'm sure you're wondering why I've come to see you, Clara began. Elizabeth shook her head. Of course, I'm not. You need to find a way to support your family, or you need to marry a man who can do it for you. I'm very impressed you were able to support them for as long as you have without help. Clara sighed, pleased that she understood, and there was no censure in her eyes. Is there someone you can send me to? Elizabeth turned to the desk she was sitting in front of and quickly flipped through the letters there. I think this one would work well for you. He's in a similar situation. Clara took the letter Elizabeth offered and quickly read through it. Dear potential bride, I'm meeting a woman who is willing and capable of managing a ranch house. I have two children, Gertrude and Robert, aged six and four, respectively. My wife died and left me alone with them six months ago, 
and I must admit that I have no idea how to run a household or raise children. Alice did all of that for me. I would like a woman who is over 25. I do not mind if she has been married before or if she has children. No more than four children please, because I already have my two. If you're willing to work hard and take on two children that are not your own, please send me a letter. I would like someone who is willing to move quickly as my children are not eating well, because I'm incapable of cooking a meal without burning it. I live in rural Montana and work a ranch. I'm not a rich man, but I can certainly afford a few more mouths to feed. Thank you. Albert Hansen. Clara read over the letter again, before looking up at Elizabeth. Yes, he sounds like what I need. Elizabeth smiled. I thought of you when I first read the letter. Really? You should have brought it to me. I just got it yesterday. I was planning on talking to you about it at church tomorrow. Clara sighed. What's next? I've never been a mail-order bride before. Well, first thing is writing him back. Are you in a hurry to get this done? Yes, I have to be off the farm in sixty days or less. Clara was embarrassed to admit it, but it didn't seem to bother Elizabeth at all. That's a good amount of time to accomplish this in. Elizabeth handed Clara a pen and paper. You write. I'm going to run and have tea and cookies sent in here. She left the room in a hurry, and Clara noticed the bell for summoning servants with a smile. Elizabeth was obviously not used to living in wealth. She hurriedly wrote the letter and finished it after Elizabeth came back. Handing it to the younger woman, she sighed. I have no idea how my children are going to feel about this. Elizabeth shrugged. I hope they'll be happy to have food to eat and decent clothes to wear. Clara sighed. I went to the mercantile to get fabric to make a new dress for Natalie and forgot all about it when I saw your advertisement. I'll have to go back on my way home. They ate the cookies and tea while Elizabeth talked about the whole mail-order bride process. Susan couldn't be happier. I thought it was strange that she ended up married to her groom's brother, but she seems content there. She's expecting. Clara smiled. She'd always liked Susan. How does she feel about that? I remember how she always felt about the demon horde. I think she's happy about it. She certainly seems to be anyway. Her husband had four boys when they married, so it will be nice if they can have one of their own. She's hoping for a girl. Of course she is. With four boys a girl would be very welcome. Clara stood. I need to go buy some fabric and head back to the farm. Thanks for the tea and cookies. Elizabeth stood, smiling at the older woman. I'm glad you came by. I'll run the return letter over to you as soon as I receive it. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. I'm going to keep working the farm and get as much as I can from the crop this year. Maybe I can go to my new husband with some clothes that haven't been patched twenty times on my back. He'll send train tickets and a small amount of money for the trip. Don't worry too much about having your own. Elizabeth walked Clara to the door and watched her walk away, hoping the older woman would be able to settle in well in her new home. Albert left the children in the wagon and hurried into the mercantile to check the mail. Billings was the biggest town around, but it was still small enough that there was no need for a post office. Any mail for me? He'd started checking last week. He could only spare one day a week to drive into town, so he checked while he was there buying bread and jam. Samuel handed him a letter. Got this one. Albert looked at the return address and opened the letter. Two letters fell out for him. One from the owner of the agency, but the other was the one he focused on as he walked back to the wagon. Dear Albert, my name is Clara Baldwin, and I'm a 28-year-old widow. I have a daughter who is 10 and a son who is 8. I've been widowed for two years and trying to keep up the farm that my husband worked until his death. 
the three of us need a fresh start. I enjoy cooking and would love to be just a housewife again, instead of a housewife and a farmer. My children are hard workers as well, and we would work hard for you. I'm not beautiful, but so far no small children have run away screaming upon seeing my face. I await your reply. Yours, Clara. Albert smiled at the words and carefully thumped the letter against his thigh. She'd do. He walked back to the front of the mercantile and quickly wrote a letter back before going to the train station. He bought three tickets for three weeks later leaving from Beckham, Massachusetts and arriving in Billings, Montana. He wasn't looking forward to having a wife and two new children, but he was looking forward to having a clean house and good meals again. He mailed his letter, payment for the service, train tickets, and a small amount of money to help his future wife with her food along the trip before leaving Billings. On the way home, he carefully explained what he'd done to his children. When your mama died, she left us with no one to cook or clean for us. I keep trying, but I'm just not good at it. He sighed. I'm sending back east for a wife to come and take care of us. The one I found has two children. Gertie looked up at him. So we won't have bread and jam for every meal anymore? He shook his head. No, your new mama will cook and clean and teach you to do both of those things as well. She'll be here in a little over a month. Gertie nodded, putting her arm around Robert. That sounds good, Papa. We'll keep taking care of each other until then. Nothing else was said as they made the hour drive to their home north of Billings. As they pulled into the yard, Albert looked around thinking about how little he'd done to keep up the house that summer. The vegetable plot lay fallow, and the house needed a fresh coat of paint. He just didn't have time to worry about it, though. He had to get the rest of the fences mended before the bad weather came on them. The snows could start in November, or they could start in September. He hoped that November would be the answer, but you just never knew in Montana. She sounded like she was a strong woman, to be able to keep her children on her own two years after her husband's death, but she'd have to be very strong to survive through the winters here. He said a quick prayer, asking that God make her stronger than she already was so she could make it through. He took the children into the house and gave Gertie orders to watch her brother. I'm going to unhitch the team and get to work. You take care of your brother now. Yes, Papa. Gertie stood beside her brother holding his hand. She made it clear that she knew her job was to take care of him. He gave her a nod of encouragement before leaving to go out and mend fences close to the house. There just weren't enough neighbors close that he could take the time to leave them with others. He hoped his wife knew how to read and write well, because the children would need to be taught at home as well. There were no schools close enough to learn in. He put the team into the stable and saddled his favorite riding horse. Swinging up onto her back, he rode out onto the range toward the border that was closest to the house. He'd mend this fence today. His new wife would be there soon. He hoped she understood when he put her in the same bedroom as her daughter. He couldn't have a new love in his life, not even with how much he needed a wife and mother for his children. He would feel like he was cheating on his wife. Paula had contracted a wasting disease. She'd gotten weaker and weaker. He took her into town to see the doctor, but he'd said there was nothing he could do. She was dying. She'd been gone four months later. His Sally had been a beautiful woman, and he missed her every day. They'd grown up in Texas, but she hadn't liked the heat. So they'd made the move from Texas ranchers to Montana ranchers. He wondered if they'd been stupid to make the trip. He berated himself every day, thinking she'd have lived if they'd just stayed in Texas. He shook his head and jumped down from his horse once he realized where he was. It was time to work. He couldn't risk losing his cattle this winter. He'd have three extra mouths to feed. Chapter 2 Clara carefully packed her dishes into the barrel she'd purchased for them, 
She didn't have much more time to leave, and she'd stay with her parents as soon as she'd sold everything off. Just for a little while, though. They'd made it clear they couldn't afford to feed three extra mouths on an ongoing basis. The buyers for the dishes would be there soon. She looked around her small kitchen. The oven and work tables had already been sold. The kitchen table was gone. The room was almost empty. Just the dishes and the pots and pans were left. The pots and pans would be sold the following day, and she'd be required to move at that point. She sighed. She hated the idea of giving up her independence and moving in with her parents. She'd been on her own for far too long. She was startled by a knock on the door and checked the clock still hanging on the wall. The buyer for the dishes was already there? They were two hours early. She opened the door wide. Oh, Elizabeth. Come in. Elizabeth stepped into the kitchen and looked around. You've got almost everything packed up. Clara nodded. We're all moving in with my parents tonight. She sighed. They're complaining about how much will cost them, but I'll have a little bit of money to help out with bills in case Albert doesn't want me. Elizabeth held out a letter. That's why I'm here. I have a letter for you. Clara wiped her hands on her apron and took the letter. She opened it, obviously nervous about what was inside. Dear Clara, you sound like you're just what we're looking for. I've enclosed train tickets for you. I will meet you at the station in Billings, and we'll have an hour drive from there. I'll have both my children with me. I'm tall and have dark hair. We'll marry before we leave town. I look forward to meeting you and your children. Yours, Albert. She looked at the train tickets included and saw they left in three days. She breathed a sigh of relief when she saw the money he'd included as well. She could give the money she'd made selling everything to her parents for the inconvenience of having her and the children for three nights, and then she could use the money he'd sent for the things she'd need. She mentally calculated. There would be enough to give her parents something even if she used a bit of the money for fabric for new clothes. She and Natalie both needed a lot of new things, and so did Clarence. She sighed. She'd give her parents as much as she could. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our train leaves in three days. Clara smiled at the younger woman as best she could. She didn't want her to think she wasn't grateful for the help, but honestly? She had no desire to go to Montana of all places. Elizabeth squeezed Clara's hand as if she understood the words that weren't spoken. I'll see you off at the train station. What time does your train leave? Nine in the morning. I'll meet you there at half past eight. You don't need to see me off. I'll be there with the children. Elizabeth shook her head. I'll be there. Do you need anything before I go? No. I'll see you before we leave. Clara went back to packing, hoping that the people purchasing her dishes would hurry. She had to shop for some fabric for new clothes for her children now. When the children came in from school, Clara told them the next day would be their last. We're leaving first thing Monday morning to go to Montana. There's a man there that I'll marry. He has two children. Natalie gaped at her. You're marrying a stranger? Clara straightened her spine. Yes, I'm marrying a stranger. I don't really have a choice in the matter. We're losing the farm and have nowhere to go. Natalie's eyes filled with tears. But all my friends are here. You'll make new friends. Clara looked down at her hands, feeling like she was doing something horrible for her daughter, but knowing there was no real choice. I'm sorry, Natalie. I really don't have a choice. She hugged her daughter, noticing the stiff way the girl held herself against her. I want to stay with Grandma and Grandpa. Natalie insisted. You can't. You have to come with me. Clarence poked Natalie. You need to listen to Mama. We have to go to Montana.
Clarence had always dreamed of going west and being a cowboy. This was something he wanted to do. Listening to Natalie while and complain about having to move grated on Clara's nerves until she finally told the girl she didn't want to hear another word. She was ten years old and too old to be complaining about things she should understand. They walked to her parents' house that night, and when they arrived, Clara carefully explained they would only be there for three days. She gave her mother $15 to pay for any food they'd eat while they were there and make up for the inconvenience of having them. Alice Johnson shook her head. It's not the money, dear. It's that you didn't plan well. She shut the money back at Clara. You should be able to support yourself and your children without our help. Clara refused to meet her mother's eyes. I'll be going to the mercantile tomorrow and I'll need to sew up until we leave. I'd rather you kept the money. She couldn't believe how unsupportive her mother was being. She hadn't expected her husband to die young. How could she have? She helped with the dishes that night, while the children made themselves scarce. Clara knew that Natalie was going to try to get her mother alone while they were there, and she decided to cut her off at the pass. I think Natalie is going to ask you if she can live here with you while Clarence and I go on to Montana. I want you to tell her no. Alice sighed. I'll tell her you said to tell her no. Clara took a deep breath, determined to hold her temper. I want the no to come from you, mother. She needs to understand that she's not going to be allowed to come back here to live with you if she doesn't like Montana. Why are you taking her to Montana if you know she won't like it? Clara turned on her mother. Why do you think I'm taking her there? I've been working night and day for two years trying to make the farm work for me. I have nowhere to live and nowhere to go. I'm marrying a total stranger so my children will have food to eat and a roof over their heads. I'm doing the best I can for them. Alice shook her head. You shouldn't have married beneath you the way you did. Beneath me? Clara put the last dish away and slowly put the towel she'd used to dry the dishes on the counter. Good night, mother. Please remember what I said. Tell Natalie she's not welcome to stay here with you. Clara climbed the stairs to her childhood bedroom she'd be sharing with Natalie for the next two days. Clarence was across the hall from them. She sat down on the edge of the bed. Do you want to go to school tomorrow, or do you want to go to the mercantile with me to choose fabric for your new dresses? Natalie's eyes lit up. New dresses? She hadn't had new dresses in years, not since her father had died. May I help you pick out fabric? Clara smiled and put her arm around her daughter's shoulders. I'd like that a lot. We can make them together this weekend as well. The days passed with a flurry of activity. Every minute she wasn't helping her mother, Clara was in the tiny bedroom she was sharing with Natalie working on dresses. She made Natalie's first and decided to hold off on her own. Hers were at least decent if not a little worn. Natalie's were much too short and tight and desperately needed to be thrown into the rag bag. When Monday morning dawned, she said goodbye to her parents at breakfast. All right, when I arrive, so you'll know how to reach me, and you'll know we're okay, she promised. Her father nodded slowly. I hope this man isn't a farmer like Nathan. Clara bit her lip. Nathan had been a good husband and father, and she'd loved him, despite how her parents felt about him. He's a rancher. A rancher? That's not much better than a farmer. William frowned at her. Clara shrugged. I didn't have a lot of choices. Men don't beat down the doors of widows, begging them to marry them so they can shower them with gifts and affection. She stood. Thank you for allowing us to stay these past few days. She wished she didn't have to be so formal, but she didn't feel like she could be anything else with them. Her father drove her into town to help her with the two trunks she was taking. She had finished two dresses for Natalie, and she planned on making at least one dress for herself on the trip. Clarence had more clothes 
because her brother had a son who was just older than Clarence, and he got his old clothes. They weren't in perfect shape, and she'd have to make some more soon, but she wouldn't be embarrassed if they weren't done when she got to Montana. At the train station, Elizabeth sat beside Clara while the children sat across from them. Natalie looked pretty in her new dress, but she looked angry with the world. Clarence looked excited. None of them had ever been on a train before, and he was the only one excited about it. I wanted to have a quick talk with you before you go, Elizabeth told her. She'd given her a canvas bag full of sandwiches for the trip, which Clara was thrilled with. She didn't want to spend all of Albert's money before she arrived in Montana. Clara turned her attention from her pouting daughter to Elizabeth. Of course. I want you to know if Albert isn't who he seems you don't have to marry him. You'll have a place here. If he hurts you in any way, you need to just come home. Clara shook her head. I have no home any longer. I'll stay no matter what. Elizabeth shook her head. If anything happens, if he hits you, I want you to come back here. I will find you a job and you'll have a place to live with me until you're settled. She kept her voice in a whisper so the children wouldn't hear her, but her voice was adamant. Clara stared at her for a moment, before slowly nodding. I'll come back if he hits me. Elizabeth looked relieved and gave Clara a one-armed hug. Write to me when you get there to let me know you're okay. Clara nodded. I'll do that. She couldn't help but wonder why the younger woman cared but she wouldn't turn down a place to stay if her marriage was bad. The conductor called out their train, and Clara got to her feet. She'd seen trains before, but had never really thought about what it would be like to ride on one. She stared up at the huge machine and tried not to show her fear in front of her children. Thank you for all your help, she told Elizabeth, before motioning the children to go before her to get to the train. They found seats together with Clarence sitting across from Clara and Natalie. Clara immediately leaned down to take out the pieces of the dress she was making for herself. She'd carefully cut it out before leaving her mother's, but she needed to do all the sewing on the train. She offered two pieces to Natalie to work on to give the girl something to do during the long hours they'd have until the first stop, but Natalie shook her head, refusing to even look at her. Clara sighed. It was going to be a long trip. It took a full week to reach Montana with a long stop in Chicago to switch trains. Clara had been convinced she'd lose one or both of her children in the big city, but they'd all managed to wash a bit and find their way to the other train. Clara kept up her sewing. She was able to make two dresses and an apron before they pulled into the station in Billings. I don't know why you're bothering with a new apron, Mama you're just going to get it dirty again. Natalie's voice had been a constant whine in her ear through the trip, and Clara was ready to scream. I'm not starting a new marriage with an old dirty apron. Natalie had rolled her eyes at her mother, but not another word had been said on the subject of aprons. They got off the train together, Clara's eyes looking out over the faces, wondering which face was the one that was waiting for her. Finally, she spotted a tall man with dark hair and eyes off to the side of the platform who was holding the hands of a young girl and boy. She lifted her hand in a slight wave, trying to verify that he was the one they were looking for. The man nodded at her and walked in her direction, indicating he must be the one who was waiting for her and her children. She walked toward him, finding his face hard. There didn't seem to be any welcome on his face at all. Was he not Albert? When they reached one another, she smiled and said, Albert? He gave a quick nod, saying nothing, just taking her bags from her. We have to collect our trunks as well, she told him. He nodded, walking toward the area where trunks and large items were being distributed to their rightful owners. His children stayed with her, and she smiled down at them. The girl was staring up at her with wide gray eyes and she seemed almost frightened. Are you Gertrude? Clara asked. The girl nodded. She pointed to her brother. This is Robert, 
It's nice to meet you both. This is my daughter, Natalie, and my son, Clarence. I'm Clara. Gertrude nodded. Papa said you were here to be our new mama. That's right. I am. Natalie and Clarence will be your new sister and brother. Okay. Clara started them all walking in the direction Albert had taken. She nodded at Clarence. Go see if you can help with our trunks. Clarence hurried ahead, going to catch up with Robert and offer to help. She watched as Albert and Clarence carefully lifted the first trunk down together and carried it to an old farm wagon. It was just like the one she'd used back home, so it was a welcome sight. It was late September, and the weather was already nippy. She hoped they wouldn't be out too late that evening. When she reached the wagon, Albert helped her up, before he and Clarence went off to get the other trunk. Once both trunks were in the back, the four children climbed in with them. Natalie still had her looks of defiance on her face, but Clara was grateful that she was saying nothing as she sat with the other children. Clara looked down at her old dress, wishing she'd had time to change into one of the new ones she'd just made. This one was gray and had seen better days. We're going straight to the preacher's house, Albert said. They were the first words he'd said to her and she was almost startled to hear his deep voice. Will there be time before the ceremony for me to change into a new dress? I'd rather not get married in this one, she said. Then why'd you wear it, he asked, obviously exasperated by her question. She looked down, staring at the tips of her shoes. I've been wearing the same dress for a week since we left Massachusetts. I haven't really had an opportunity to change. He nodded curtly. We'll ask the pastor's wife. He said nothing else about how hard her journey must have been. When they arrived, he helped her down from the wagon, and she picked up the carpet bag at her feet with her new dress in it. The new dress was lavender with tiny flowers on it. She would thought it looked so pretty when she'd finished it the previous evening, and now she didn't even feel like putting it on for the first time. She was marrying an angry, unhappy man. What had she gotten herself into? The children followed behind them, and she was whisked away to the pastor's bedroom by the pastor's wife so she could quickly change her dress. Thank you so much for letting me change in here. Mrs. Simpson smiled at her. It's no problem. I wouldn't want to have to marry in that dirty old dress either. Clara blushed, knowing the woman couldn't have meant the words the way they sounded. She rushed to change her clothes and straightened her hair. She'd have given everything she owned for a bath just then, but there was no doubt in her mind that was too much to ask. She hurried back into the parlor where the pastor waited with her future husband. Was she really going to marry him? She hurried to his side and said all the right words, her hand tucked in his. When the pastor announced it was time for Albert to kiss her, she could see on his face that he'd rather do anything than press his lips to hers. Nathan had always told her she was pretty. Had she somehow become hideous since his death? He barely brushed his lips against hers before thanking the pastor and leading them all out to the wagon. Once they were there, she removed the money she had remaining from what he'd sent and pressed it into his hand. We were careful and didn't use all your money. I want you to have what's left. He looked at her in surprise, but simply nodded and put the money into his pocket. No other words were spoken between them during the hour-long drive to the ranch. The children talked in the back. Several times she heard Clarence exclaim as he saw a cowboy ride past. She didn't turn around to see but she was certain his face was lighting up as he talked about what he wanted to do as he grew up. When they pulled up to the ranch, she could see that the vegetable garden hadn't been tended. She'd have to see to that next year. Hopefully, he had enough supplies that she could make good meals for them all, because good cook that she was, without ingredients, they would still be hungry. He helped her down from the wagon, and he and Clarence carried both trunks in. Clara walked into the house behind them, looking around her. 
The house was much grander than the one she'd lived in back in Massachusetts. The kitchen and parlor were two separate rooms. There was a bedroom downstairs that was obviously meant for her and Albert, and there were several upstairs. Both trunks were taken upstairs, and she was surprised by that. She pulled Albert off to one side. One of the trunks is mine. Shouldn't we keep it downstairs? She wasn't certain what he was thinking, but she'd been married before and she knew that intimacy was easier when you shared a bed. Especially when there were children around. He shook his head, not meeting her eyes. You'll be sharing a room with your daughter. At least for now. He walked back outside without saying another word to her. She stood staring after him with surprise. He wasn't planning on sharing her bed with her? She should be surprised, she knew, and she certainly wasn't disappointed. She couldn't imagine sharing a bed with a man as prickly as her new husband. She walked to the kitchen and looked at the stove, which was much fancier than any she'd ever used. The kitchen had a pump, and she was pleased to see that he had a good supply of food. Everything she would need was there, except fresh meat, and she was certain he'd provide that as he could. The kitchen was dirty, and the floor was dirtier, but she could see he'd made an effort to keep things up. She knew how hard it was to play both mother and father to children, so she wouldn't say a word. She hurried to fix a simple meal out of the food he had ready for her. She found a loaf of bread, some eggs, and some milk and made some French toast. She didn't normally make breakfast for dinner, but she didn't normally cook a meal for six people after being on a train for a week either. If he didn't like it, he could cook his own meal. The children were upstairs, becoming acquainted with one another, and she could hear their voices drifting down the stairs as she hurriedly cooked for them all. She would have normally sent Clarence outside to help with the evening chores, but she knew he was just as tired as she was. None of them had slept well on the train, and with as long as the journey was, they were all ready to just sleep for a week. She mentally made a list of things she'd need to accomplish the following day while she cooked. The children would need to be signed up for school. She would need to give the house a good thorough cleaning. She wished she could keep Natalie home with her to do that, but she couldn't let her daughter get behind in school. She needed to make an inventory of all the food so she could make meals for the family. She needed to go through all of the new family's clothes and see if anything needed to be mended or replaced. She had enough fabric that she could make a few dresses for Gertrude and some clothes for Robert as well. She just needed to find out what they were lacking. She wanted to make sure they had enough food for the winter set in within the next few days, because from what she'd read about the area, if she didn't have the food she needed in September, they were unlikely to make it through the long winter. When she finished making the French toast, she called up the stairs to the children to come down to eat. Albert came in just as they were all sitting down. She'd poured milk for everyone and the toast was in the center of the table with butter and syrup she'd found to be used for it. Albert said a quick prayer and they all ate in silence. Her children, who usually never stopped talking, seemed in awe of their new stepfather and almost afraid to speak in front of him. Once dinner was finished, she stood to wash the dishes, but Albert stopped her. Let the girls do the dishes. Gertrude knows how to dry them, and I'm sure Natalie knows how to wash. Clara collapsed back into her chair, gratefully. She was willing to do the dishes if she needed to, but she certainly liked the idea of the girls doing them after each meal. She looked at her husband, wondering if she could talk to him without him getting angry. Where's the school? I need to sign the children up tomorrow. He shook his head. There's no school close enough for them to go to. Closest is in Billings, and that's an hour drive each way. Most folks around these parts teach their children at home. Clara blinked a few times. I've never even considered that. I have their school books, but I'm no teacher. He shrugged. How hard can it be? Follow the books and give them lessons to study. He looked at Gertrude where she stood on a stool drying the dishes.
Time for Gertie to learn too. You can sit them all down together. Clara sighed. Apparently she had no choice. She wished she'd known that before coming out here, but she'd make the best of it. Hopefully soon there'd be a school the children could attend. I guess we'll get the house in shape and start school on Monday. Albert nodded. Sounds smart. He continued to watch the girls as they washed the dishes. Both girls should be able to help you a lot around the house. He seemed to be looking for topics as well, wanting to get to know her, but feeling awkward about it. Yes, they can. Clarence would like to help around the ranch if you think he's old enough to do so. He's got in his head he wants to be a cowboy. Albert smiled at Clarence, who was sitting there, hanging on their every word. You want to go out to help me mend fences tomorrow? He had a mare he could let the boy use. An eight-year-old could be of some help around a ranch. Not as much as a teenaged boy, but if he trained him right now, he'd be able to do a man's work in a few years. Clara was surprised to see Albert smile. It was the first time since she'd met him that he hadn't looked stern. The smile completely transformed his face into something that could almost be called handsome. Maybe as he became more comfortable, he'd smile more. Clarence nodded emphatically. I would like that a lot, sir. Albert made a face. Sounds good. I'll work hard. Clarence looked down at the table as he said that, obviously embarrassed. Albert looked back at Clara. We'll eat at sunrise or a little before. I'll leave the girls and little Robert with you and take Clarence. If he's a good help, he can come with me every day and learn in the evenings. It won't hurt him. Clara bit her lip, but nodded. She could see the wisdom in his words. A boy who learned a trade young was so much more likely to have a good job as an adult. She was just thankful that Albert didn't think he needed to abandon his studies altogether. That would be fine. Do you want me to teach Robert to read when I teach Gertrude? Albert seemed to think about it for a moment, but he shook his head. No. Not yet. Gertie is eager to learn, but Robert still enjoys playing too much. Let him be a little boy for another year or two. He shrugged. If he shows an interest, teach him his letters or numbers. Otherwise, let him play. That's what I'll do then. She looked at the four children and new husband she'd be taking care of. Is there anything in particular you want me to cook for supper tomorrow? He shook his head. I'll butcher a chicken in the morning, and you can do something with that if you would. I'm going to butcher one of the steer on Saturday so you can make some plants for beef for next week. Got some salt pork in the cellar, but never had any idea how to fix it. My Sally was good at those things, but I have no idea what I'm supposed to do when I get in a kitchen. That's why I'm here. I'll handle the meals. She looked over at Gertie. Do you want me to start teaching Gertie how to cook and keep house right away? Or give her another year or two? Some men thought girls should be able to just play with dolls until they were teenagers, and she didn't want to do anything that would offend him. My wife had already started her on those things, so more training will be good for her. Just teach her whatever you're working with Natalie on. They both need to learn to be good wives. Clara looked at Gertie's dress, which was much too short. I'll start making her dresses as well, if you'd like. He gave a nod. She needs new clothes. When he didn't say anything else, she stood. Clarence, I want you to wash up and head to bed. If you're going to be doing a man's work tomorrow, you'll need to get a good night's sleep. The boys were going to be sharing a room, so she looked down at little Robert as well. You need to get ready for bed as well, Robert. Robert stood and followed along meekly. Call me when you're ready, and I'll come in and listen to your prayers, she told the boys. I'm going to go upstairs and wash up as well. When you girls are finished with the dishes, come on up. We'll get ready for bed then.
She looked at Albert, still sitting at the table, and gave a quick nod. Good night, Albert. I'll have breakfast ready first thing in the morning. Albert sat at the table, watching her walk away. She was a pretty woman and very pleasing on the eyes. He had done well, choosing a new bride. He sighed and bowed his head. He didn't want to notice that she was pretty. It was his job to remain true to Sally. He loved her, and she'd given him two beautiful children. No, Clara was only there to cook, clean, and take care of the children. His needs came last. Clara changed into her nightgown and climbed between the sheets of the bed she was going to share with Natalie. She bowed her head and whispered, Please God, help me to do the right thing for this family. Albert is hurting. Gertie seems so sad. They all need a good woman to take care of them. Help me to be that good woman. I can't fail at this. I need strength.